providing people some hope. At the bus stop, it would not be infrequent that someone would tell me, one, I've never voted for someone that won before, and two, I trust you and you make me feel better about local government. Because it's really difficult and I think over time, trust even in local government has eroded. And I'm not quite sure what to do about it, but I was glad that I, I felt like a conduit for people, like they could feel heard when they spoke. So to me, although it wasn't a municipal daycare center, a brick and mortar thing, um, it felt very accomplished. In terms of ordinances, I have to say, uh, an ordinance that started off as a Save the Trees ordinance evolved because of planning staff into a broader uh, sensitive areas ordinance mm. that happened because of some persistence on my part at the very beginning and great process on the part of planning staff getting all the stakeholders and developers and environmental activists involved to create an ordinance that would be functional and doable and enforceable. So to me, I would say the sensitive areas ordinance. And also during your time on city council, you got to see the human rights ordinance come into effect. Well, our human rights ordinance in Iowa City has been incredibly strong for decades and long before I came on council. But there were a couple of things that happened in terms of human rights in general and the ordinance ordinance when I was involved in local government. One was before I was on council, I was appointed as, an, as a member of an ad hoc committee looking at whether children or dependents would be a protected class of people in the area of housing. It used to be you would see ads in the paper that said no children, no children, no children. You don't see that anymore because that committee was successful at adding dependents as a protected class. During my time on council, we added domestic partnership uh, um, option that people could come in in same-sex relationships who in Iowa at that time could not be married. Thankfully, that is different now since April 3rd of last year, um, where people could sign up, although they had to make declarations that heterosexual couples don't have to make even when they're getting married in a church or in a, by the state in a civil union, where they have to declare that they've been monogamous for six months, that they have some financial intertwinings where heterosexual couples don't have to make those declarations. So it wasn't perfect, but it offered an option, which was really good. Um, and then in 1997, we added gender identity as a protected class. And that was a 7-0 vote. So I was very proud of the city council for that. Wow. So after your time on Iowa City City Council, you became the executive director of the Emma Goldman Clinic. Mm -hmm. How did that transition happen and how many years did you serve there? Well, I knew that I was going to complete my term at the end of 1999 and that I wasn't interested in, an, in running again. I was feeling a little dulled and burnt out in that particular role and wanted to sharpen my edge. And I also needed some income because my art business kind of had gone down because of all the time I put into city council and I was kind of living on very low income anyway. And I was just ready to look for work and I, someone called me and said, did you know that there's this position available? And I read the job description and thought, this is pretty pithy. I'm not sure if I can do all these things, but there's a lot of ways where I fit perfectly. So I hadn't updated my resume since 1983 because I hadn't really had a job where I worked for someone else or hadn't worked for everybody um, at one time. So I updated my resume and set it in and did the interviews and I was offered the position, which I was shocked about. I had never had kind of a regular full-time job before and I was just about to turn 40. And um, my sister thought that was pretty funny and sent me a very sexual bouquet of flowers <laughs> congratulating me on finally having a full-time job. And I was happy to have a living wage and benefits and to work at a place where I had passion for the mission. And they were really looking for someone to reintroduce the clinic to the community and be very involved and put the public face and have a, a strong voice at the clinic and to do some fundraising. And those were my skill sets. And so it was a great match. 
and I was very happy to be there for 10 years. And I had very high morale during all that time for that position and, and still do for the organization. And left because another opportunity came my way that was a once in a lifetime thing and that was to buy Don's Hide and Beat Away. So um, I am still the grant writer at the Emma Goldman Clinic so I'm very happy to maintain that connection and relationship. And I think a lot of people will always associate you with the clinic in that role. Yes, I knew I was doing my job of being the public face when I would walk down the street and people would say, hi, Emma, I mean, Karen. And it's like, well, that's not really good. I mean, it's good, but it's really, I'm doing organizational work. I'm not doing personal work. You know, it's not the Karen Covey Clinic. It is the Emma Goldman Clinic. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that may not be very apparent on the surface is the the overlap between the work at the Emma Goldman Clinic and at Dawn's Hide and Beat Away. They're both very women-centered spaces. They're both about people claiming who they are and voicing that and designing their own lives. Now one is a lot more intimate in terms of reproductive health care than at the bead store, but there are lots of overlaps and so I, I see those connections every day as I spend time at the bead store. Let's talk a little bit about your life as an artist. How has how did art come into your life? The 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 jock and the brain and the <laughs> <laughs> well, the girl who was undefinable <laughs> in high school. Uh, I'd have to again say my family. Um, all of my sisters and I are artsy, craftsy, artist people. And my grandmother was a seamstress, and I think we got some of her talent and skills. She would take us whenever we lived. Whenever dad would go off to war, we would go to live in Des Moines near both sets of grandparents. And then we would spend weekends with my grandmother, sometimes uh, Miriam Cubby, Mims Cubby, and she would, we would have a sewing project. And she was a beater, too. She would bead on wedding dresses, on shoes, on bags, on sweaters. She would put monograms on cashmere sweaters. I have my mom's sweater. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we would learn things. And she would always say, well, the skirt has to be below the knees. And we'd say, no, it has to be above the knees. And then we'd realize, OK, below the knee, because we could go home and we knew how to hem. So we could <laughs> hem it however we wanted. <laughs> so she created little monsters. And so we always were doing cross-stitch, knitting, crocheting, embroidery, sewing. Be for me, beading. I, in sixth grade here at Helen Lemmy School, I would make these bracelets that I would sell to my classmates with one free restringing. <laughs> so I'm really not doing anything different at 50. It's a full circle now <laughs> for you. So balancing an artistic life and a life of social activism and, and a political career, how, how have you done that over the years? Is there some, some secret to how you've kind of kept well, that balanced? it keeps me balanced, actually. Mm -hmm. The reading of all that legalese, the constituency work of being on the street, talking with people, that's a great form of activism, and I wish more activists would value electoral work, especially on the local level. And then the, the artist, and so I get to use all sides of my brain. So it helps keep me balanced, actually. It allowed me to be part of economic development because I would travel the Midwest on weekends with my pottery and my beadwork and set up on the street and sell things. That's how I made my living. Mm. So I was part of economic development. I was a small business owner. It, oh, I didn't have a retail space, but I was a small, self-employed sole proprietor owner. Um, I joined Potters for Peace. <laughs> <laughs> where we would raise money and uh, get kilns and chemicals and tools down to places, especially in South America, where people were having pottery cooperatives and needing supplies. So there's lots and lots of ways to combine it. And then here at, at Dawn's Hide and Beat Away within the retail space, um, there's lots of ways that those parts of myself get melded. We have Don's Coffee House on the first Friday of every month raising money for nonprofits and political groups. We host political meetings in the back. Um, and on a real personal level, we um, help empower people. People come in here, they're wanting to learn skills, they're wanting to define their own creative self, and we provide tools, supplies, and skills for them to figure that out and make it happen. It's more than just beating something, it's, it's empowering. It is, yeah. it is. It helps people define themselves and then act on it. Being all of these things and sort of being hard to define and being very much a public figure 
in Iowa City. You've kind of come to represent lots of things to lots of different people. And um, I've noticed in the comments section on the Press Citizen that your, your name is often invoked. And when it is invoked,